early 20th century saw the outbreak of some of the deadliest conflicts in history, world wars between global powers that left unimaginable suffering in their wake. Despite this, the period from the end of World War II to the present has been called the Long Peace, a somewhat ironic moniker given what it took to achieve that peace. For nuclear scientists and physicists in the early 20th century, years of theorizing and research culminated on July 16, 1945 in the Trinity Test, when scientists from the Manhattan Project detonated the world's first nuclear device in New Mexico. That moment has been called the dawn of the atomic age. The unsuspecting civilians that would be contaminated with fallout from the Trinity test, now called downwinders, made clear that this would be an age defined not only by the promise of nuclear technology, but also its devastation, which would be fully demonstrated only a few weeks later. The detonation of atomic bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan in 1945, killed between 110 and 210,000 people. In the aftermath of that destruction, Albert Einstein, J. Robert Oppenheimer, and Manhattan Project scientists and engineers created the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, an organization meant to warn and educate the public about the potential harm of their creation. The public's imagination during the post-war period would be filled with visions of nuclear-powered transportation and endless supplies of energy. A giant of limitless power at man's command. But the inventors of the technology behind the atomic bomb were more concerned about the prospect of an arms race and worldwide nuclear war. There is no denying that since that moment, the shadow of the atom bomb has been across all our lives. Over its more than 75-year history, the Bulletin has monitored existential threats to humanity and communicated insights to the public through its magazine, its website, its events, and the Doomsday Clock, which visualizes humanity's metaphorical proximity to global catastrophe. Martil Langsdorff, an artist married to a Manhattan Project engineer, created the Doomsday Clock in 1947 as the first cover image for the Bulletin's magazine. It was initially set at seven minutes to midnight. The clock first moved in 1949 when Bulletin editor Eugene Rabinowitz decided to move the minute hand forward to three minutes to midnight in response to the Soviet Union testing its first nuclear weapon, years ahead of when many in the U.S. government thought possible. In all, the clock has moved 25 times, first as dictated by Rabinowitz and later as set by the Bulletin's Science and Security Board. The clock has moved closer and further away in response to a variety of technological and diplomatic events. At the end of the Cold War and the signing of the Nuclear START Treaty, the Doomsday Clock moved the furthest from midnight it's ever been, 17 minutes to midnight, highlighting humanity's potential to prioritize peace and move back the clock. Today, the Doomsday Clock represents the judgment of leading science and security experts about the threat to human existence with a focus on man-made threats, nuclear risk, climate change, and new disruptive technologies like artificial intelligence and new biotechnology. The clock is watched closely by scientists and policymakers, but it has also been a prominent feature in pop culture since its emergence. It has been a thematic device in feature films like Dr. Strangelove, the Jurassic World series, and Justice League. It's been described in popular songs by artists like The Who, Smashing Pumpkins, and Bright Eyes. It's been a motif of video games like Rise of Nations, books like The Imposter, the fantasy novel Wielding a Red Sword, and comic books like Watchmen. Throughout its history, the Doomsday Clock has helped focus global attention on the gravest threats to the planet. More than 75 years since it was first introduced, the clock remains an enduring symbol of the promise and peril of humanity's technological prowess. Last year, the doomsday clock was moved for the 25th time to 90 seconds to midnight, the closest it has ever been, citing the conflict in Ukraine not only as a potential point of nuclear escalation, but the war's effects in undermining global efforts to combat climate change, and disinformation, and the alarm it raised about biological and chemical warfare. The bulletin urged action from the world's leaders on the multitude of threats facing the planet. As UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said last year, the doomsday clock is a global alarm clock. Have leaders acted with urgency? The bulletin has been watching. Again, our Science and Security Board met and asked two important questions. Is humanity safer or at greater risk this year compared to last year? 
And is humanity safer or at greater risk this year compared to the more than 75 years we have been asking the question? In 2023, trends continue to point ominously towards global catastrophe. The war in Ukraine poses an ever-present risk of nuclear escalation, and the October 7 attack in Israel and war in Gaza provides further illustration of the horrors of modern war, even without nuclear escalation. The countries with nuclear weapons are engaged in modernization programs that threaten to create a new nuclear arms race. Earth experienced its hottest year on record, and massive floods, fires, and other climate-related disasters have taken root. And lack of action on climate change threatens billions of lives and livelihoods. Biological research aimed at preventing future pandemics has proven useful, but also presents the risk of causing one. And recent advances in artificial intelligence raise a variety of questions about how to control a technology that could improve or threaten civilization in countless ways. Last year, we expressed amplified concern by moving the clock to 90 seconds to midnight, the closest to global catastrophe it has ever been. The risks of last year continue with unabated ferocity and continue to shape this year. Today, we once again set the doomsday clock to express a continuing and unprecedented level of risk. It is 90 seconds to midnight. Hello. I'm Rachel Bronson, President and CEO of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. Today I'm joined by members of the Bulletin Science and Security Board, those who help set the doomsday clock. Our goal is to provide some insight into why we have set the clock at 90 seconds to midnight. And if you'd like to know more, we've released a statement today that goes into greater depth and can be found at our website at thebulletin.org. After our brief discussion, we will be turning to renowned science educator Bill Nye and UChicago professor Daniel Holtz, the chair of the Bulletin Science and Security Board. But before we do that, I'm joined today by Asha George, Executive Director of the Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense, Princeton Professor Alex Glaser, and Stanford Senior Researcher Herb Lin. Joining us from India is Professor Ambush Sagar, who helps lead the Indian Institute for Technology in Delhi. So let's dive in. Alex. There are two key messages in our statement. Um, and they are, one, that 90 seconds to midnight is profoundly unstable and must not engender complacency. And two, the advancement of technology is quickening and outpacing our ability to govern them. But let's pull back the curtain um, for our audience today and talk through why we've said it. So Alex, can you summarize the highlights or I guess the lowlights of the current nuclear landscape? Uh, thank you, uh, Rachel. Um, when, when we set the clock last year, there were major concerns uh, that nuclear weapons could be used uh, in, in Ukraine. And um, today's clock setting was, was still overshadowed uh, by the war in, in Ukraine, uh, but also the war uh, in Gaza, uh, which has caused enormous human suffering and uh, could lead to a broader conflict. Uh, in the region involving several nuclear weapon states and, and regional powers. Uh, so it's really against this uh, backdrop um, that we're facing a, a crisis in nuclear arms control, and I could go into a great detail, but let me highlight perhaps just uh, two aspects. Uh, first is that uh, traditional nuclear arms control really, really has come to uh, um, an end for now. Um, Russia withdrew or suspended uh, the New START Treaty, uh, withdrew its ratification from the Comprehensive uh, Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, uh, which the United States, uh, of course, uh, never ratified to begin with. Uh, but perhaps more importantly, that's the second point. Um, uh, many weapon states are currently pursuing uh, extensive modernization and uh, expansion programs uh, that will really for the first time since the end of the Cold War and essentially providing the infrastructure that could last until uh, 2100. Um, China is increasing its nuclear arsenal now um, standing at 500 uh, nuclear weapons and for the first time at least in my adult life uh, there is now talk in, in, in Washington uh, that the US nuclear arsenal will have to increase um, also uh, in order to match uh, the arsenals of Russia and China combined. 
Um, so in many ways, we're uh, setting ourselves up for a three-way uh, arms race, which is uh, unprecedented and, and quite uh, concerning. So the picture is quite bleak uh, in, on the nuclear side this year. Yeah, there's a lot that we'll come back to. Um, Ambush, I'd like to go to you now. Maybe you can set the scene for us um, on climate, which has had a tough year as well. Uh, sure, happy to do so. Um, on climate, the story has really been a mixed story. There's been a fair amount of bad news for sure, but there's also some good news. Uh, I think as already mentioned, 2023 was the hottest year on record and a range of extreme events uh, across the world made more likely by climate change. Uh, green, global greenhouse gas emissions continue to rise. Um, global and North Atlantic sea surface temperatures broke records. Antarctic ice was at, low, uh, was at lowest levels, and I could go on, but I think one gets the picture. Um, I do want to note that not everyone is obviously affected equally by this, and you know maybe we'll talk about this a little bit later. Uh, also, unfortunately, Certainly, the policies and pledges in place uh, to address climate change do not allow us, uh, at least as of now, to uh, meet the Paris Climate Agreement goals. Having said that, uh, there is some good news. We are moving in the right direction, even if not as fast as uh, one would like. Renewables are uh, dominating new energy deployment. Uh, last year, there was $1.7 trillion invested in clean energy um, uh, uh, at the uh, climate COP in Dubai uh, a few months ago, two months ago. Uh, 120 countries uh, representing a significant fraction of the world's GDP, half of the world's GDP, agreed to triple the renewable energy uh, deployment by 2030 and double energy efficiency. Um, all good news moving in the right direction. The International Energy Agency believes that uh, fossil fuels will peak uh, by 2030 so on balance, uh, as I said earlier, we're moving in the right direction, but not as fast or as deeply as one would like. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And Herb, this past year, um, artificial intelligence was really kind of on the table and new disruptive technologies. We spent some time really talking through it in our deliberations. Do you want to kind of set the landscape for how we should be thinking about new disruptive technologies, maybe with a frame around AI? Sure. Um, we debated whether uh, AI was going to be an existential threat uh, to, to humanity. Uh, it turns out there is debate about that, a um, large amount of debate uh, in, in the community, even among experts. Um, regardless of whether you believe that uh, it is or is not going to be an existential threat, it's clear that it's a disruptive technology and, and it's going to um, it, it has dis disrupted many segments of society um, already. Uh, AI has lots of potential for magnifying corruption in the information environment and making um, this in the, the disinformation problem worse. Uh, and that's really bad because it, the, the threat multiplier effect means that we're not going to be able to solve other hard problems like nuclear war and climate change. Um, and so that's really tough. Uh, uh, you know, that, that makes the solving those problems much harder. And you know we talked we talked about the the question about um, AI and and is it going to pose an existential threat? I have to note that any physical threat to existence from AI has to come because somebody chose to hook AI up to the physical world, it's some physical physical system. And it's true, like that if you make a bad human choice, like connecting ChatGP to the nuclear launch system or something like that, um, yes, that's an existential threat. But that's a nuclear threat. That's not an AI threat. Mm -hmm. um, so. Mm -hmm. And um, Ash, I wanted you to follow um, her because I know we talk in in the um, biosecurity, even biosafety, but the biosecurity space. There's a lot of thinking about its connection with AI, in addition to to how it affects the current landscape as well. So. Do you want to help broaden that out? Sure. Well, one thing I want to say is we, we, because of what happened last year and the discussions that started to occur, there's this sense that AI just suddenly popped up. Uh, but it, it didn't. You know, we, we've had a pretty long tail on this one. And we've seen it improve and improve and improve, which it's supposed to do. It's, it's AI. It's supposed to. Uh, but last year, we heard more discussion about AI and its application in terms of 
uh, genetic engineering, but also in terms of developing biological weapons, uh, posing questions that would allow a person without a whole lot of technical expertise to obtain biological agents, put together a biological weapon, uh, and, you know, and so forth. And there are also the applications to uh, facilities. Uh, you know, as Herb said, you can hook GPT up to something and make those two systems work together. Now suddenly you can access a facility or figure out how a facility works too. And, and you know, that has pretty big implications for laboratory uh, biosafety and biosecurity. So one of the things that the bulletin that we spend a lot of time um, thinking about is not only the advancement of the technology, but how it's governed, right? Mm -hmm. That technologies have huge potentials, but also huge risk. And if we can manage those risks, we can benefit from its um, potentials. Um, there's actually been some pretty interesting governance efforts, Herb, I'm going to come back to you, particular that's worth noting. Again, probably not fast enough, but um, in, in the, the AI space that is, would have been surprising to us a year ago. Well, it's true. Many nations have recognized some need to govern uh, AI in some sense, in the broad sense of the term, and this, of course, is that's what you're talking about, mm -hmm. that, that, the, that some nations, many nations, do recognize that need. Um, but there's also, the, I mean, the other side of that is that all of these nations hope that AI is going to um, give them military and strategic and economic advantages over their uh, rivals, um, and so any agreement to, uh, among nations to curtail or govern or restrict uh, the application of AI in any way uh, is going to cur make well curtail some of those advantages. And so transforming this recognition that there is a, uh, a need for um, governance into something real, something actionable, is going to be really tough. Yeah, and you're seeing that, Ash, in the bio space too, kind of attention to it, but not nearly fast enough. Not nearly fast enough, but also the, you, there is this tension between advancement and using this tool to help uh, yeah. with the safety and help with with the research efforts that have to go on uh, and maybe get ahead of some of these things. Mm -hmm. there's, that, there's that on the one side and then on the other side there's all this horrible terrible stuff. So governance can't just handle the one, the one negative piece. It has to take into account the other side and you know there's this whole thing about economic uh, and other competitiveness with the world's bioeconomy right now. You cannot just up and tell a, a country or a countries, hey, do, you can't use this. Um, they they have to think about the uh, you know the 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 economic implications for themselves. To say that we're going to cut off a tool like this entirely isn't realistic, and so uh, it poses another challenge to governance. How do you govern uh, when you have a situation like this? Ambush, I'm going to pull you in here because I think in terms of governance, you were mentioning COP and, and the instruments we have uh, around climate, but also I know this point on who it affects and how is something you think about quite often on the equity side of it. So I wonder if this might be a good point for you to jump in. Uh, sure. You know, the, the climate problem is, is, is an interesting one because it really is uh, a global problem. It affects everyone and everyone actually has uh, some uh, effect on, on climate change through their through their emissions. Uh, so it's it's one of these issues that really does require global global governance. Uh, and uh, you know, for example, you know, the COP, as I mentioned earlier, which is the conference of the parties to the framework convention on climate change, to which all governments are signatories, is really a kind of uh, an annual uh, stock taking, but also uh, uh, efforts to try to move the needle forward jointly. Uh, having said that, I mean, your, the point that you made is, is very important, right? That it, everybody, every country uh, really thinks about climate change differently and experiences climate change differently. Uh, you know, Asha just mentioned uh, issues about uh, competitiveness, right? In the, in the climate area, there's a kind of a tension between uh, competitiveness uh, desires by countries to uh, be leaders in these new uh, green technologies uh, that actually, in a sense, is at, at odds with cooperation in some way. So we have this tension there, and then, of course, because the magnitude and the nature of the, of the climate threat depends, uh, varies drastically across countries. 
It depends on local manifestations of the climate of uh, climate change. It depends on local social and economic circumstances uh, and capacity. And therefore, we have this situation where uh, different countries are experiencing the problems differently, and different countries have different kinds of capabilities to engage with the problem. And this is playing out in this global arena where we have to work together, but there are also these different national interests. So uh, it's, it is a challenge, but uh, we are moving forward, uh, again, slowly and not as quickly as we would like, but still moving forward. Yeah, I think there are some real similarities when we think of the, the how everybody's affected different. It certainly comes up in the bio space. But Alex, when it comes to global governance in your opening remarks, it's, it's kind of a despairing time in, in uh, sort of the nuclear conversations. What are you seeing on the global governance landscape? Because it is so extraordinarily important that we do have some engagement between the nuclear powers in particular. Well, I would uh, remind us that uh, the 2010s were actually the first decade uh, since the end of World War II that hasn't seen a new nuclear weapon state, uh, which you know was quite remarkable, um, given you know where we are today. And uh, a lot of credit goes to the uh, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and the the nuclear taboo that has evolved uh, with it. But the treaty, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, is in, in a crisis, in a deep crisis. We haven't seen uh, a lot of progress with regard to nuclear disarmament, and we mentioned already efforts to remodernize and expand uh, arsenals. So the one highlight that I would uh, mention here is really uh, the Treaty on the Prohibition uh, of Nuclear Weapons, the TPNW, uh, which outright uh, bans the, the possession and uh, the use of nuclear weapons. It actually even bans the threat of use of nuclear weapons. It had, currently has 70 states' parties. Um, of course, it's, it's not supported by um, the nuclear weapon states and, and their allies. Of course, actually, they um, oppose it very much uh, so. But speaking only for myself here, uh, I, in my view, the treaty does offer a new perspective on uh, important nuclear issues. Uh, for many countries uh, and their citizens. And I think, uh, looking forward, it, it may not be likely, uh, but I think it's still quite possible that the treaty will gain new momentum in uh, the next couple of years, especially perhaps in, in Europe, when the war in uh, Ukraine has been uh, you know, resolved uh, and a sustainable peace agreement has been found, and the countries reevaluate uh, their positions and, and policies towards uh, nuclear weapons, perhaps especially in Europe. So a question at the bulletin we always get is, well, what, what can individuals do? What can people do? How to get engaged? And it's, it's very difficult because these are huge global issues. And um, just a couple years ago when we had Hank Green on, he said, you know, no one individual can solve all these problems, but we can't solve any of them without individuals. So maybe very quickly in, in our last few minutes before we move over to Daniel Holtz and Bill Nye, Alex, I'm going to come to you. Why don't you start us on, is the TPNW a place that people can get engaged, or is there other ways that people can try to keep pressure on their leaders to um, create a safer future for us? Well, uh, you, you mentioned the TPNW. Let me uh, just perhaps, if I had one point, I would say uh, 2024 is an election year in, in many countries uh, around the, the planet. Uh, voting matters. And, and of course, there are uh, presidential elections in this, uh, in this country. And uh, all US elections raise the issue of the you know, immense power vested in US presidents who have uh, the sole authority to order the use of these uh, weapons, and they can do so within within minutes. Um, uh, this has always been, in in our view, a very uh, dangerous arrangement. Um, and uh, now, I firmly believe uh, that the risks of uh, blundering into a nuclear war, uh, given that we can launch them so quickly, are much much higher than uh, the risks of a you know a surprise nuclear attack, a bolt out of the blue. Uh, so I firmly believe, and many on the board uh, do so as well, that we need uh, changes in, in these postures, uh, launch on warning, uh, first use, etc. cetera. And um, you know, we hope that you know, these uh, conversations could at least be part of um, the conversations that we're going to have around the U.S. elections you know, later this year. And then Herb, um, thank you, Alex. Um, Herb, to you, with so much of this in the private sector, presumably um, on a lot of this tech, there are 
there, there's other avenues for individuals to help make a difference? Well, I think that, that the fact that uh, pri the private sector holds so much influence and power over the deployment of these technologies, AI, for example, space technologies, for example, they have a, a huge amount of influence. And I, I think that the first thing people ought to do is to understand that these private sector actors um, don't necessarily act in the national or in international interest. Um, they act to serve their own goals, the, the goals of profit, the goals of their CEO, or, 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 or what have you. Um, and I would urge people to think about how one can govern private sector actors, uh, especially in democracies, which is not an easy task. Asha, I think that you struggle with that as well, or think about that, but there's, what about in the biospace in terms of if individuals are watching, you know, what can they, how can they pay attention to this, this how can they get engaged? Well, look, I think everybody, individuals all the way up to the highest levels of government and our international organizations, I think we need to pay much more attention to what's going on with bio. We should not, and any of us, be in a position where we're waking up one day and we're suddenly surprised that some disease started in some country and has, has made it to our borders. You know, we all know, that disease doesn't know any borders anyway. We can maintain some awareness, we can maintain some preparedness, we can do some things about our own health, we can care about what's going on in other countries. But I also think we should be maintaining some awareness of what's going on with weapons threats, what's going on with the laboratory down the street. These are all things that we uh, can know about, and we can be speaking to our elected and uh, other appointed uh, officials. Uh, and Alex talked about the presidency, and, and the presidency is huge and humongous. But our country and many countries also have something called Congress. And um, while kind of depends on the country, how, how we elect a Congress or how we elect the president might or might not depend on an individual's vote. Uh, individual votes do count for who gets into Congress. We should be paying attention to what their platforms are and what their approach is. Uh, I think it's, we've gone way too long sort of ignoring bio and putting it off to the, to the side under, under nuclear, under climate change, under, under dis other disruptive technologies. Um, we can do this. We're educated people all throughout the world. Let's pay attention. Ambush, I'm going to give you the last word before we move on, but um, why don't you talk, uh, talk a bit about how individuals can engage on climate. There seems to be often a little bit more space maybe there, and especially you know, sitting in India, what are you seeing? Uh, yeah, well, I think my, uh, on the climate area, I think my views uh, are, will very much echo what's already been said, right? That uh, individuals certainly can play a very important role. Uh, the climate area is interesting. Uh, you know, some of the earlier questions you know, or issues in the climate area were around whether climate change was indeed happening and whether human activity was uh, responsible for it. That was an uh, uh, issue that was settled in the scientific domain. Uh, settled in the scientific domain and in many cases in the social and political domains, although as we know, not fully. There still is efforts to, and actually concerted efforts, to uh, have disinformation around climate change to even question issues that have been settled scientifically. So I think that's the first area where individuals can play a role is to make sure that uh, there is uh, increasing societal consensus around the science of climate change. Um, the second part is, now that we know climate, is, climate change is real and humans are responsible, why aren't we doing enough about that? And that really is, uh, has to be an issue that has to be taken on board first and foremost by governments because the nature of the problem is such that governments really have to lead from the front. And I think, again, as, as, as was also <coughs> mentioned earlier, that this is where uh, individuals can really play a role in pushing for greater uh, policies and, and political action in this space. I want to mention two particular points here. One is that a lot of the focus in the climate area in terms of action on climate change focuses on mitigation, which is reducing greenhouse gases, greenhouse gas emissions that are driving climate change. At the same time, we also need to make sure that there's equal attention being paid in political and uh, policy circles around adaptation, which is uh, making sure that the people who are getting affected most by climate change are uh, 
basically were able to manage and reduce the impacts of, of, those, uh, of, of climate change on those people. Uh, secondly, I think the point I want to make is that while it's true that this is, a, as I mentioned earlier, it's a global problem and everybody uh, should be uh, engaged in the problem, it's not a problem that has been caused by everybody equally. Uh, countries and people who are richer have contributed more to the emissions uh, historically and therefore because uh, this is a problem of accumulated greenhouse gases, it's a cumulative responsibility. Uh, but also, and perhaps uh, more importantly, not everybody has equal capacity and resources to engage with the problem. So while it is truly a problem where everybody has to engage, individuals and countries, we also have to understand that uh, the leadership for engaging with the problem uh, cannot be equal. Uh, th those with the greatest privilege, the greatest resources, the greatest financial and technical resources really have to take the lead in that. And I think individuals across the world have, make, have to make sure that their uh, political leaders uh, really understand this, this reality and therefore push for climate action, but push it, push it in a way that's uh, fair and equitable and just. Thank you so much. I'm going to uh, turn it now over to my colleague, uh, Daniel Holtz and, and uh, Bill Nye. Before I do, though, I really want to thank our members of our Science and Security Board today, Amr Sagar in um, India, Alex Glasser from Princeton, um, Asha George here in uh, the US, uh, in Washington DC where we're seated right now, Herb Lynn um, from Stanford. Um, thank you so much. And uh, Daniel, over to you right now. You're coming back to me. Okay, so apparently we were, we're gonna hold until we get to uh, Daniel and um, Bill. So while we do that, um, uh, why don't we turn back here? And I think that if we don't um, fix that shortly, we're going to say goodbye to our audience. So thank you for that. But let's see if we can get it um, um, fixed beforehand. Alex, I think I'm going to come back to you um, one more time. Um, I know uh, we went pretty quickly through some of the, the changing nuclear realities. And I just want to give you a little bit more time to maybe talk through a little bit on the landscape. We've been hearing um, from about North Korea and things that are happening there. We still continue to watch developments in Iran. Is there anything that maybe we can add in? And then if we're not able to fix the technical difficulties, I think then we'll probably close out with that. Well, you're right. Uh, a lot of the attention uh, currently, and rightfully so, is um, on the war in, in Ukraine and uh, in Gaza, as, as I mentioned. But these other crises have not uh, gone away. Um, that in a normal year we would be talking about uh, at one of these uh, events. Uh, North Korea is essentially uh, proceeding with uh, its, uh, its nuclear program. We, the bulletin just ran an article uh, earlier this week, uh, including uh, by, by Sick Hacker, arguing that uh, North Korea might actually be preparing for w uh, war, which is something that no one really talks about uh, very much. Um, so that is uh, still very much on the table. We've seen reports that uh, North Korea is uh, collaborating with Russia in, in, in the war in Ukraine. So everything is, is connected on, on that end. Meanwhile, in, in Iran, very similar uh, story uh, in, in many ways. Uh, the JCPOA, of course, uh, the, the agreement uh, that was in place and that is no longer working. Uh, uh, you know, that is now a, a sort of thing of the past. Uh, Iran is enriching uranium um, at an unprecedented level, at two very high enrichment levels, and it's our understanding that from a technical perspective, if Iran made a decision to pursue a nuclear weapon, uh, it may be just months away uh, from, from doing so. And, you know, again, there's the connection uh, with the war in the Middle East where, you know, Iran at some point may, uh, may, may be involved. So um, these are crises that are, you know, looming. 
and um, that we haven't uh, talked about very much, but it doesn't mean that they don't exist, uh, not at all. Right, and, and just because it's a natural segue, Asha, you've been watching these um, wars and crises and gives you a lot of concern in your colleagues about how to think about different biological um, crises. Could you, I know you've thought and talked about that. Could you just share that a bit? Well, I think there are two things. One is many of the same comments that Alex just made could be made about uh, the biological side. Uh, the State Department talks about uh, two countries, Russia and North Korea, having active offensive biological weapons programs. It talks about China and Iran also uh, engaging in some activities that could or may not be uh, biological weapons oriented. And we have to assume that there aren't just four countries that are looking at this. Um, so we have that. We have this specter of the use of biological weapons uh, on battlefields in crises. But then you also have the other side of it where war and public health uh, are, are inextricably linked. So if you, if you have wars and, pl and countries in crisis, their health goes down, the public health goes down, they become more vulnerable, and then we have more diseases you know, circulating uh, in their own countries and elsewhere. And you, know, you can layer on all this other stuff too. Uh, Amuj will talk about, uh, has talked about, uh, the impact of climate change on, on disease um, is particularly worrisome I mean, yes, it's all global, but in an ar arenas where there's already war going on and crises already going on, um, it, it's just a huge complicating factor. Melting of the Arctic and uh, some of the encroachment that we're talking about that contributes to climate change also contributes to diseases coming to the fore that we haven't seen in many, many years. Uh, I mean, centuries, and, and I would imagine in some cases. So we have a really complicated situation uh, that we, uh, f in terms of the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention and some of these other conventions and treaties, just don't really address particularly well because I think the world tried to leave it behind in 1976. Um, but, you know, it's a new day and there are new, there are new weapons. Uh, so the, I think the greatest difficulty, though, is going to be, at least with a nuclear weapon, you can see it. Same thing with, with chemical. With biological, I don't know that it's going to be quite that uh, obvious. You know, nobody should be, from a military standpoint, coming forward with a biological weapon that just destroys everybody all at once. You'd actually want to do something lower level. So there's a question. And our ability to attribute things, as we've seen with other diseases, is not great, not here in the United States or throughout the world. Um, so. Uh, that, that, that's my perspective, our perspective on, on biological weapons, and it's something we have to continue to track uh, as we go forward from here. And just because you mentioned attribution, Herb, I know you're one of the, the loudest voices in our room as we're talking through this about mis- and disinformation and our ability, I mean, as attribution and some of these issues become so much more important, the inability to know where to turn, who to look to for, for authoritative information, that's something you've been thinking a lot about and what that actually means for our ability to solve problems. You want to talk a little bit about in the, the kind of advancement of those technologies? Well, so artificial intelligence gives you, for example, the idea that you can create deep fakes of, of images and videos and, and audio uh, and even text that uh, sounds authentic but mm -hmm. isn't. Um, uh, and these fake, these deep fakes can be deployed to influence opinion and uh, polarize opinion further and, 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 and so on. Um, uh, today it is possible to, I mean, there, there, first of all, there are no technological solutions to, to that. If for every deep fake that comes along, yes, you could probably develop a way of, especially with audio and video, there, you could probably develop a way of detecting that it was fake, but a technological way, but there'll be this interval where you won't have that way of doing it, and so at that point the fakers are going to win. Okay, and then there's going to be another round of, of, of that. Um, but the worst problem is often nobody cares about whether or not it's a fake, it's fake at all. And they just take the information because it, this is friendly to me, it, it supports my position and I'll just believe it and, I'll, and I let it influence my emotions and, 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 and so on. Uh, so what you have to do is you have to learn to care where it's coming from. You have to care whether or not 
this is really true. And by doing some research and so on, you can find out whether it's you're checking other sources and so on. But of course, the problem with that is that you have to check sources that you might not otherwise trust. You might have to check, a, you know, a, a you know a mainstream um, media source uh, for that rather than some fringe source. Uh, so you have to want to do that, and that's really the, 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 the biggest problem. So people want to be able to defend themselves against this stuff. First, they have to care. If you want to do it, then there are many ways of, of, of helping yourself out. But the first most important thing is that you, want, you have to care. Well, on that, we're going to take a short break, and uh, we'll be back momentarily with, um, with Daniel Holtz and Bill Nye. Um, thank you to uh, our guests today. and. Um, Hold on shortly, and we'll be back to you in a moment. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, and I'm delighted to be joined by science educator Bill Nye to discuss actions we can take to turn back the hands of the doomsday clock. So, Bill, you've pointed out that many apocalypse films start with characters <laughs> ignoring the warnings of scientists. Yes, yes. And we've just heard scientists and experts raising alarm bells. So my question to you is, is real life following the plot of a disaster movie? I, I guess so, yeah. I mean. <clears throat> I remember very well Colossus, the Forbin project. This is an older reference from the disco era, but the premise was that the Soviet computers, the con computer that controlled Soviet weapons was connected to the United States' computer that controlled nuclear weapons, and wouldn't it be great if the two computers could agree on not blowing stuff up? And so, uh, so things went wrong. Things went very wrong. And what everybody's afraid of, if I understand it, you are a physicist full time. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm an engineer. I still have a license man, but I don't work in it full time. But the, when you write a computer program in the good old days, by that I mean three years ago, what you'd put in, you had a pretty good idea of what was going to come yeah. out. But the trouble with artificial intelligence is we don't know what's going to come out. So what if these fire control systems, as they're called, interact in a way that's unpredictable and yeah. Yeah. sometimes the surprises are good but sometimes not so sometimes good, surprises are good. <laughs> okay. yeah. um, so I know you share our concern about climate change and as you travel the world giving talks and 
speaking with people, what is your sense of the level of awareness and kind of engagement with climate change? Uh, is the tide finally turning? Well, the tide is turning-ish. Everybody, don't take my word for it. Uh, in the, a few years ago, the mainstream media, as it's referred to, New York Times, Washington Post, Baltimore Sun, whatever it might be, would have an article about climate change once a month or something. Now there's an article almost every day about, with a reference to climate change. Even in the Wall Street Journal, which is sort of two newspapers in one, the, the regular reporting has climate change every day and the editorial page it doesn't. And everybody running for president on the other side, on the conservative side right now, none of them are willing to mention climate change. And the, couple, the one guy who did has dropped, they've all dropped out. So that's bad for the future. And people say to me, Bill, Nye, science guy, what can I do about climate change? Vote. Vote. It all adds up. Vote. We yeah. can do this, people. We can do this. And this, this is my next question. You know, 2024, as what's been mentioned, is this unusual election year. Billions of people around the world voting. So how much does our future depend on the outcomes of these votes? Well, this is, it's the most important thing in the world. <laughs> is that a big deal? So I thought you were being ironic or something. So I used to say, uh, I'm of a certain age, I used to say that the election of 2000 was the most important election of our lifetime because no matter what else happened, if Al Gore, people, man, people love to hate Al Gore. Knock yourselves out, but... If he had become president, we would have done something, something about climate change. But as it was, we didn't do anything about it. In fact, things just got worse and worse. Snowball, pun intended, effect got uh, doubled down on drill, baby, drill, and all that. But uh, with that in mind, uh, let's keep that in mind and vote. If nothing else, take, take the environment into account when you vote. You can hate me. You can hate all of us people of my ancestry and upbringing, you can hate me, hate me, hate me, fine, knock yourselves out, but the world's climate is changing because of human activity, and the U.S. has to lead. Now look, I'm from the United States, English, American English is my first language, uh, okay, I got all that. My perspective is skewed or influenced or whatever, but the United States is the world's most influential culture. No matter what else you say about it, it is the world leader in culture. And so uh, uh, we want to export our values as well as whatever else we might sell. And along that line, we want to be the world leaders in renewable energy and fairness. What everybody's running around nowadays all bent out of shape about diversity, equity, inclusion issues. We want, that's all about being fair. We want it to be fair, inclusive, and we want to change the world. Back to you, Daniel. And, and all of this impacts all of us, including those of us in the US. So we need to be engaged. And so kind of along those lines, we've heard you know, about all these threats to civilization, nuclear and bio, climate change. Well, the biological threat is the real deal, man. Yeah, pandemics. I mean, there are lots of things to worry about. So my question is, you know, how do we raise the alarm? How do we convey this? kind of sense of urgency without making people despondent. And you know, and part of that is, how do you keep up your sense of well, optimism? Well, doomism, so-called, right? Yeah. yeah, where you just, it's all so bad, we, there's nothing we can do, and so on. Yeah. You guys, you've got to be optimistic, or you're not going to get anything done. Here in the US, it's a big deal this time of year with these football teams going at it, US football. Uh, Nobody who plays on either team thinks they're going to lose. Like, that's not how this works, man. You, by the time you get to that level, you believe that you can beat the other team. Not easily. You have tremendous respect for the other team. You're concerned about the other team, but you know in your heart that you're going to be able to prevail. You guys, we can do this. Come on, we can solve these problems. We can address these problems. And I strongly believe, as I mentioned a moment ago, it starts with voting. And if you're too young to vote out there, make sure that your grown-ups in your world vote. 
and just please take the environment into account. The environment includes climate change, human induced, all this carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere, biological threats, and this accidental incorporation of all these crazy weapons, which just happened with people disagreeing yeah. for a few decades. Yeah, so vote, talk to your friends, talk to your family. The other thing we could do, Daniel, he started it, don't come running to me. <laughs> The other thing we could do about climate change and biological threats and so on is talk about it. If we were talking about it the way we talk about all these other important issues, crime, uh, football games, yeah. we would be doing something about it. And so when I look at the atomic scientist clock, that is a conversation piece, yeah. literally, right? This thing, this sweep, uh, this minute hand is set up to get people talking about these big That's issues. Right. Yeah. So thank you. And the idea, 90 seconds to midnight, the idea is it's a conversation starter. Like this is meant to prod people to So it used to be it. 10 minutes or something, right? 17 yeah, minutes. Yeah, 17 minutes at the end of the Cold War. The and end of the Cold War. The Cold War is still going on. Yeah, yeah. Everybody, OK, you hate me. You hate people of my background and ancestry. I got all that. You hate progressives. I got all that. But the thing in Ukraine is just the extended dance mix of World War II. I mean, it's still going on. Yeah. This is, it's now, not something you can fool with, people. Now with nuclear weapons. Yes, now with nuclear weapons. And, and, and well, it's, you know, not only Russia, but China. We're headed into a three-way arms race. It's, it's, it's really... It's a solvable it's problem. Nobody wants to shoot these things. Yeah. The idea was just to have them yes. so that the, nobody would shoot them. But now with artificial intelligence, as I understand it, you could be shooting by accident. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? All right, uh, back so, to you. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, along these lines, so let's get back to climate. In some ways, the solution to climate is very straightforward. We just need to stop burning fossil fuels. Whoa, what? That's it. That's, <laughs> you yeah. should have said something. <laughs> I know. What are you going to do? Okay, start there are some details. With, with you know, solar panels, like, wind, and I mean, distribution. Maybe that lines. might help. So, and, you know, I understand everybody has this idea, well, uh, swords into plowshares. We'll take nuclear material and make it into nuclear power plants. Nominally an okay idea. But our problems are political. Nobody wants... You know, NIMBY, not in my backyard. Yeah. Well, there's also banana. Are you down with banana? I don't know that one. Build banana. Build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. <laughs> <laughs> and so I understand this sounds like a panacea. We just take this material, repurpose it. But it takes 15, 20 years to get a license for these things. We don't, yeah. it's just much harder. The political problems are, in a sense, more difficult than the technical ones. And the security problems are the big problems. That's yes. how we got there. So, yeah. better transmission lines, uh, wind solar, and not shut down the nuclear power plants that are working now. Yeah. But uh, and then, if you're asking me, you are a physicist full time. You're all. We're not going to say. We're not going to talk about that one astronomical phenomenon. No, no, no. no black holes. But oh. Is it reasonable to you that we will have nuclear fusion? in the next I, few decades. Yeah, so I, I mean, it would be great. Nuclear fusion is harnessing the power of the sun. Wouldn't that be amazing? Um, it's very technically challenging. But so we're, many people are working on it. They're closer than ever, right? We're closer than ever, but we're still decades away, even in the most optimistic yeah. scenarios. So, so by the, it's not going to save us. Um, so we need to do everything else we can. So you guys, there isn't, there isn't a panacea. There isn't what everybody talks about, a silver bullet. But the longest journey begins with but a single step. Yes. Let us reduce fossil fuels as fast as we can. Let us uh, advance our transportation system so they're not quite so inefficient. <laughs> okay. And let's, uh, the big thing I keep talking about is transmission lines. If we had a way to move electricity around yeah. less inefficiently, we could really get something We need done. to do Everything, Everything we can all at once. Except for burn fossil fuels. That's the one thing the one we thing. need to stop, and we can't stop. Yeah. I think that's 
Speaking of stopping, that's probably a good place to end. I want to oh, thank whoa, wow. science educator Bill Nye. Um, to learn more about the Doomsday Clock and why it's at 90 seconds to midnight and to follow these important issues all year long, please check out our website, thebulletin.org. Thank you for joining us. We are adjourned.